So uh, the lecture today is going to focus mostly on image contrast and spin echoes. Um, if you know a little bit about MR already, uh, one of the really advantageous things about the technique is the flexible ways in which we can change uh, image contrast. Uh, and not only can we manipulate image contrast, but we can acquire that imaging data in lots of different ways. And one of the sort of key or even fundamental ways that we do so is by uh, uh, using the so-called spin echo technique. So we'll talk a fair bit about uh, that today as well. Okay, so image contrast. Why is image contrast such a big deal? This is one way that I like to describe it. Well, as human observers, the visual system is really sensitive to contrast, right? That's what our eyes are good at detecting, signal differences. That, that one, uh, say, tissue is darker or brighter than some other nearby adjacent tissue. We're good at detecting uh, contrast. We're actually not good at detecting absolute luminance. We don't do a good job of saying how bright it is on an absolute scale. We can't really measure that with our heads, and I can absolutely convince you of that. So this is an optical illusion, and the question is, you have square A and you have square B. Uh, is the luminance of A right, the brightness of A, is it greater than, less than, or equal to the luminance of B? So do you think A is brighter than B? Probably not. Do you think A is darker than B? I would say yes. <laughs> it's a checkerboard, right? Come on. Uh, or is it equal? And so you can kind of guess it's a trick, right? And so if I cover up A and I just slide that over, it turns out it's identical, all right? So this illusion to me convinces me I'm garbage at detecting luminance, right? How bright something is. But I no problem seeing a checkerboard pattern here, right? You're good at contrast. So you guys are uh, contrast detectors. Uh, that's maybe not the most polite thing I could call you, but you're contrast detectors. So what do we mean by contrast? Well, contrast is typically the difference in signal intensity between two tissues. Usually it's adjacent tissues that we care about, but it could be distant tissues as well. So the difference in signal intensity between region A and, uh, sorry, region A and region B divided by some reference. So the reference could be all kinds of things, some background number, it could be region A, it could be region B, it could be the average of the two, it doesn't matter. I think you have some inherent concept of what we mean by contrast. Now, when it comes to MR, the contrast that we get between two tissues, A and B, is the function of a lot of things, okay? MR has a, a wide range of ways in which we can change the image contrast. And so, in the most general way, we say the contrast between A and B is a function of things like the proton density, how proton rich is a particular tissue. Not every tissue is, has as much water as other tissues. It also depends on what we call the T1, the T2, and the T2 star, and we're going to talk about these a lot today, or at least a fair amount today, and these are relaxation properties. It's how quickly or slowly the magnetization relaxes, and we'll get into the specifics of that uh, shortly. We can also make it depend on things like diffusion. There are diffusion-weighted methods for MR, and so the signal intensity depends on how easily water diffuses around. We can make it sensitive to the presence of a contrast agent, which actually changes things like T1 and T2. We can make it sensitive to perfusion. We can make it sensitive to susceptibility. Like the list here kind of goes on and on, and that's one of the really intriguing things about MR, but also one of its fundamental complexities, that tissue contrast or image contrast can depend on a, a bunch of things. Now, the real goal in a lot of MR is to come up with a way such that the image contrast itself somehow becomes more or less a function of just T1. And now you don't know how to do that yet. There's ways to adjust and manipulate acquisition parameters. But the idea is, wouldn't it be nice to have an image that's so-called T1 weighted? It's just really dependent or largely heavily dependent just on T1 differences in tissue types. And wouldn't it also be nice to have a so-called T2 weighted image where we can again manipulate the way we acquire the image so that such that the contrast is really pretty much just a function of the tissue T2. And if we had a T1 weighted image and a T2 weighted image, maybe those taken together and observed in parallel will give us insight to underlying tissue types and morphology and changes in tissues and things like this. So really in MR, weighted images emphasize tissue contrast for what I call a specific mechanism, just for T1, just for T2. Now the reality is every image is a subtle combination of 
different things, but we in a T1 weighted image, we're trying to dominate the image contrast with T1. We're trying to dominate the image contrast with T2. And you'll, you'll get a sense for that as we work our way through this lecture. Um, now, in point of fact, it's not just contrast that matters to us, but it's probably contrast to noise. Our imaging systems aren't perfect. Uh, we can't image people for days and weeks. And consequently, uh, when we image quickly, we're going to have uh, noise in our images. And uh, this probably stands to reason. doesn't surprise you if you've uh, done a lot of medical imaging review or of any kind before. But large, high-contrast objects are easier to see in the presence of noise. So here's a large, high-contrast object. In the presence of noise, not a problem. As you get down to these objects over here that are smaller uh, and low contrast, they really disappear. So it's, it's, it's this interesting combination right, of the object size and the object's contrast. And so in general, we want to have high contrast images so we can see differences between tissue types. Uh, and resolution plays a role in, in sort of feature conspicuity as well. So in this case, the image resolution is held constant. We can go uh, forward here. Uh, here, we've kept the noise constant. I won't explain exactly how we do that, but the noise is held constant. And we go from a low resolution image to an intermediate resolution image to a higher resolution image. And it's, you know, it's not surprising, but these low contrast objects, yeah, I think you can see them on that screen too, these low contrast, even large objects become more apparent with higher and higher resolution. So what do we want? Well, we want low noise, high resolution images, but that's really costly in terms of time, right? If you want to get high resolution images, it can take a lot of time. And if you want those to also be low in noise, it takes even more time. And so there's reasons why we don't just routinely get high resolution um, uh, low, low noise uh, images. Okay, so that's kind of some principles about image contrast and why we talk so much about image contrast in, in medical imaging in general, but probably uh, MR uh, maybe more so than other areas. So the question is what changes or manipulates image contrast in MR? And what it comes down to is actually what we call the block equations. Now I'm going to show you uh, a, a complicated set of equations. Uh, it's fine. We're not going to spend too much time on it, but I want you to know where things come from. Um, so the process that the block equations help us describe, that the fundamental equations that describe both excitation and relaxation. And so here we have a bunch of spins in the MR scanner. And at the beginning here, they're sort of polarized, right? They're pointing that north-south direction because of that B0 field. And then what happens is right about now, we play an excitation pulse, and they tip over into the transverse plane. It's only when spins are precessing in the transverse plane that we can detect them. So we have to excite them with the B1 pulse. We have to tip them over. And when we do so, they precess in the transverse plane, as you see right now. And that gives us a signal that we can measure. Now, not surprisingly, they don't stay precessing in the transverse plane forever. They relax back. So this process of relaxation is thermodynamically driven. You can't avoid it. Uh, and after the application of an RF pulse, the spins will return to their equilibrium. And their equilibrium position in the presence of this B0 field is, again, sort of pointed in that north-south direction. So this is the process of what the spins are doing as a consequence of excitation and relaxation. So these guys, uh, in 1952, got a Nobel Prize for their development of new methods for NMR precision measurements and discoveries uh, in connection therewith. Uh, so Felix Bloch, uh, fortunately, somehow got his name sort of tacked onto the equations, and Ed Purcell uh, got his name onto other things. Um, I think if there's ever a movie about this, this will probably be George Clooney, and then maybe this is Ed Harris. But I think the likelihood of a movie is probably pretty low. Anywho, okay, so this is the block equations. This is what I was saying is this really complicated system of equations. We're not going to, you know, this is not a threat. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But again, I want you to understand where this comes from. And what this system of equations does is it describes how the bulk magnetization, right, that ensemble of billions and billions of spins, changes as a function of time, okay? Don't worry about it too much. What I would like you to sort of appreciate at least is that this complicated set of equations describes for us precession, so the fact that the spins will precess in a B0 field. And it also describes two things, what we call transverse relaxation and longitudinal relaxation. Transverse relaxation affects the X and Y components of magnetization. Those are the transverse components, X and Y. Uh, 
uh, and it's strictly governed by T2. And T2 is a particular relaxation property. So t every, we'll talk about this more, but every tissue has arguably a unique T2. Uh, and T2 affects the rate of decay of the transverse magnetization. Another term that you see on the right-hand side here governs what we call longitudinal relaxation. So the magnetization is going to decay in the transverse plane, and it's going to recover along the z-axis to get back to its equilibrium. And that Z magnetization is governed by T1. T1 is the longitudinal relaxation time constant. Uh, and so you want to definitely remember that T1 is affiliated with the Z axis and T2 is associated with the XY uh, plane, if you will. Um, and what you'll see tucked in here too is this M0. M0 is the equilibrium. The spins always want to get back to M0. They're always trying to get back home. If you let them leave them alone long enough, they'll get there. Um, and then we don't need to get into it too much, but this indicates at least that there's also some dependence on things like diffusion. And diffusion weighted imaging and clinical radiology is a pretty big deal. Uh, and so you sort of notice at least that it's, that it's present there. Uh, these things I think I mostly talked about already. Uh, when it comes to relaxation, the T1 changes are relatively slow. And this O means on the order of. So it's on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, maybe even thousands of milliseconds. And we'll see what that means uh, when we look at some tables of values. T2 changes are faster, and they're order on, ten, on the order of, say, tens of milliseconds, or maybe a hundred and something milliseconds. Uh, interestingly, and this isn't totally obvious when I'm sort of waving my arms around, but the magnitude of the bulk magnetization can be zero at a certain point in time. And what that tells you or, or should mean to you is that if the magnitude of the bulk magnetization can be zero at some point in time, particular tissues can be made to be quite dark or very, very dark. And we'll see this concept when we talk about inversion recovery uh, pulse sequences. So that's sort of coming up. So what is this all about? Well, the block equations really govern the longitudinal magnetization and the transverse magnetization dynamics and as a consequence, image contrast. So these are the equations that sort of get us there. Now, fortunately, uh, there are some relatively simple solutions to that really complicated set of equations. Uh, and this last thing I, I mentioned already, but there is the potential to be uh, dependent or have some signal dependence on, on uh, diffusion as well. OK, so there are at least two, this, this page and the next page, that has relatively complicated equations, but it's, it's worth talking about because it's worth understanding. This equation falls out of the block equations. That's all you really need to know. What it tells us is how the MZ magnetization behaves as a function of time. What happens to MZ when we do something to it? Let's say that we've acted on our magnetization with an RF pulse. We've played an RF pulse. This is what happens immediately after an RF pulse. That's the thing we sort of mostly care about. And that's a period of what we call free precession. And that's kind of a, maybe a key word for MR, free precession. And it just means the spins are doing whatever they're going to do after we've played an RF pulse. They're going to try to get back to equilibrium, back to that uh, just pointing along the Z direction state. And these are the equations that govern that. The first term says that if you have any prepared magnetization, meaning you've tipped the spins over and there's magnetization that's you know, away from equilibrium, that's going to decay. So the second exponential term here says that your Z magnetization or a component of your Z magnetization decays. And the second term here says that MZ always tries to return to M0. So if we act on the spin system, we play an RF pulse, we've perturbed it, we've tipped it this way, we've tipped it that way, we've tipped it upside down. If we wait long enough, this term here will go all the way back to M0. How do I know that? Well, we have to understand a little bit about exponential functions, right? And so exponential functions, as you see here, when it comes to the Z magnetization, it depends on T1 and it depends on T1. So again, T1 is the longitudinal magnetization recovery time constant. Uh, a little hint about exponential functions, if we have e to the 0, that's 1. And if we have e to the minus infinity, that's 0. So exponential functions uh, decay, if you will. So for really, really long times, as this time goes to some really big value, this term is disappearing. It's going, uh, becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're just left with this m0 term. This term on the left-hand side here is the prepared magnetization. And if we wait for a really, really, really long time, this whole term goes to 0. 
and this whole term goes to zero. So for very, very, very long times, the Z magnetization is just the M naught magnetization, right? That's getting back to that equilibrium state. And this equation describes sort of the path or how you get to your equilibrium state at very long times, or at any point in time, rather. Uh, so here's an example, right? So here's my MZ magnetization, and I'm going to keep track of what happens to, say, fat, liver, and CSF, each of which has its own T1. Fat's T1 is 250 milliseconds, liver's twice that, and CSF is almost 10 times that. And this is what underlies sort of uh, one of the strengths of MR, that your time constants for different tissues are unique, right? This is what fundamentally gives you image contrast. Okay, so let's do a little thought experiment. This is my MZ magnetization, and I've played an RF pulse, and my RF pulse has resulted in having no MZ magnetization, okay? What kind of RF pulse is going to give me no MZ magnetization? Zero component of MZ. So these are my spin vectors, right? What's going to give this component zero? How far do I have to tip this over? It's going down. It's going down. When do I get to zero? Right about now, right? So how far did I tip it? 90, right? So a 90 degree RF pulse is going to take every tissue, fat, water, CSF, liver, lung, doesn't matter, and tip it over to the transverse plane. I have no MZ, okay? So this is a really simple experiment. That's called a saturation pulse. When you put everything into the transverse plane, we call it a saturation pulse. And this is what will happen to your MZ if you just let things freely precess. You act on it, you force it down with an RF pulse, and then you just observe. And this is what will happen. The fat signal will recover really, really quickly. This equation up here tells us this. Because the time constant for fat is short, short time constant things will change really quickly. And so fat here gets back to that equilibrium condition. I should, I should have written like M naught here, because that's going back to equilibrium, M naught. Fat gets there really quickly. Liver has a longer time constant, so it takes longer for it to crawl and climb and eventually get back up to the equilibrium uh, state. CSF has a much longer time constant, a much longer T1. Uh, if I wasn't clear, these are all the T1 values. And so CSF takes a long time to recover. So the interesting thing is, uh, okay, so how does MR work? MR works by you play an RF pulse and you basically try to make an image. If I try to make an image at this point in time here, do I have much contrast between my tissues? No, right? They're all almost the same. They're all, in this case, going to be quite dark. What if I play a saturation pulse and I wait a really, really long time to form an image? Do I have much contrast? No, right? They've all recovered. They've all gotten back to their equilibrium. So the trick with MR, one of the tricks with MR, is playing RF pulses and waiting just the right amount of time so I get maybe maximum contrast. I don't know why I would want liver CSF contrast, but this point in time here would give me really good liver CSF contrast. I might want fat liver contrast, and some time point over here is going to give me the best uh, fat liver uh, contrast. So MR is all about sort of the timing. How do we time the experiment to take the picture right when the magnetization is doing what we want it to do, right when we get, say, most contrast. Please. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about, like, why fat has a short T1 and why CSF has a long T1. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that uh, probably five or six slides. Yeah, good question. Okay, so, no, I don't think it's critical that you memorize this, this expression, but it's definitely important to remember that your MZ magnetization depends on T1, and it's definitely important to kind of have these kinds of pictures in mind of what's happening to MZ. The equation is what governs it, that's fine. You know it comes from the block equations, that's fine. But focus on sort of uh, maybe conceptually what's going on. Okay, we have another component as well, right? So we have the transverse magnetization. So I can take my MZ magnetization, I can tip it over, and I can generate transverse magnetization. If I only tip it a little bit, I just have a little component, I have a little bit of transverse magnetization. So what kind of RF pulse gives me the most transverse magnetization? How many degrees? A 90, right? So from that sort of equilibrium condition, at least, a 90 pulse is going to tip it down, and I have maximum transverse magnetization. And this is the equation that then governs the dynamics. What happens to the transverse magnetization as a function of time? Well, it's simple. It just decays, right? 
we have some initial amount of transverse magnetization, and this exponential function says it just goes away. And it goes away as a function of T2. Every tissue has a unique or semi-unique T2. And so if we look at, uh, oh, mistake, right? So this should be MXY, right? Not MZ, but MXY. And, I'm, uh, and we're saying we have a lot of MXY. That means we took our magnetization and we tipped it over. And now once it's in that transverse plane, it can only decay away. This equation says it can only decay away. Fat, it turns out, has an intermediate. Uh, oh, these values are, sorry, this is completely wrong. Um, it was a, that's, a copy, that's a bad copy-paste error. So we'll have to pull up some, uh, some T2 values here for fat, liver, and CSF. I apologize. Uh, the bottom line is you would see something similar, that fat would decay uh, quite quickly, liver would be maybe intermediate, and CSF would be uh, relatively long. I'll, I'll provide a correction for that uh, after this morning. Uh, bottom line, your M or your transverse magnetization is going to decay away as a function of time. Okay, so a couple quick true falses. Large, high contrast lesions are more conspicuous in a noisy image. Makes sense, right? Large things, high contrast, those are the easiest to see. So true. Um, MZ returns to zero or its equilibrium immediately after an RF pulse. False, right? MZ. What does MZ return to? We usually have, we have a number, we have a, at least a label for it, M0, right? So it returns to M0, and it's definitely not immediate, right? It depends on T1, strongly depends on T1. So false. Uh, MXY completely decays after a time equivalent to about five T2s. We didn't talk specifically about that, but... So five T2s, if my T2 is 100 milliseconds, I'm waiting 500 milliseconds, and I'm decaying exponentially, right? So five time constants, it's pretty much gone. So I would call this true. It's 99% gone or 98% gone. Last one, Larmor equation describes magnetization relaxation. False, right? So there's different ways to correct it, right? What does the Larmor equation tell us? about precession, right? How quickly, what's the frequency of precession? We saw it yesterday, omega equals gamma B. Um, so we have the gyromagnetic ratio in the, in the external B field. Uh, if you wanted to fix this another way, uh, you would say the block equation describes magnetization, relaxation. So the block equations was the, were those complicated equations that we had just five or six slides ago. Okay, so let's talk more about T1 and T2 relaxation. What is, this, what is this really? What are we really talking about? So these are the T2 values that we should have had on that previous slide about transverse magnetization decay. So I'll, I'll go back and fix that. But bottom line, there are uh, relatively unique T1 and T2 values for different tissue types. And this is why MR is interesting to us at all. Right? If this weren't true, there's a lot of things, but if, these, if this wasn't true, MR would probably be not a clinical imaging modality. The point is that even gray matter and white matter have subtly different T1s, and they also have subtly different T2s. And as a consequence of that, we can generate contrast between white matter and gray matter in the brain, right? Muscle has a relatively unique T1 and T2, fat, kidney, liver, CSF, lots of things, lots of tissues, right? You don't, I think, need to memorize this table, right? But it's helpful as an, as an MR practicing radiologist. Uh, it's helpful to have some ballparks in your head. These values, I think, yeah, these values are at 1.5 T. We'll talk a little bit about how there is some field strength dependence. You want to know some of these numbers. I think it's really helpful to know fat because it's sort of at one end of the spectrum with short T1s and kind of intermediate T2s. I think it's good to know CSF. Because CSF is this other kind of uh, extreme example of a really long T1 and a pretty long T2. And then depending on your subspecialty, you can pick your other favorite tissue. I think those two kind of bookend it and then you can go from there. Okay, so what about T1 relaxation? So T1 relaxation we also refer to as longitudinal or spin lattice relaxation. Longitudinal because it governs the rate of recovery of the Z magnetization. So T1 and Z go together in your head. Keep those uh, together. Uh, physicists or, or, or chemists refer to this as spin lattice relaxation. And the idea here is it's 
it's governed in part by how the spins, how the hydrogen nuclei interact with the surrounding lattice. And the lattice is sort of everything else that isn't water, say. Uh, typically, we saw this in the chart before, but typically it's on the order of hundreds of milliseconds to maybe thousands of milliseconds. So I think ballparking some of these numbers in your head is a, is a very useful thing. Um, in what, it, now, this is not obvious, but I can tell you that it's true. It's, you can't really get there from, say, first principles, but it, it addresses the earlier question about sort of what is the T1 for different tissues and why. Um, we, can, we know uh, experimentally, empirically, that T1 is long for small molecules, things like water, but it's also long for really large molecules like proteins. T1 is short for other things. It's short in particular for fats. Remember, fats are, have a different chemical environment, a lot of like CH3 groups instead of H2O groups, if you will. Uh, and T1 is short for both fats, but also intermediate-sized molecules, which stands you know, kind of in between these small and large molecules, if you will. T1 actually increases with B0. And so if you go from a 1.5 T system to a 3 T system, the T1s will be different. The T1 does have a, a subtle B0 dependence. And partly what that means is if you have a, your favorite protocol at 1.5 T and you want to go run that at 3 T, it's not going to give you identical image contrast, right? So oftentimes there's protocol differences between 1.5 and 3 T uh, in a clinical setting. Um, T1, and we'll talk more about contrast agents later, but T1 decreases with contrast agents. There's no way to lengthen the T1, right? We, it's not obvious, but there is no way to lengthen the T1. But contrast agents can help us shorten the T1. And that means the magnetization will recover more quickly. Shortening the T1 means it's a little bit more like fat and will typically be bright. A really key thing to remember, like you absolutely have to remember this, is that short T1s are bright on T1 weighted images. We'll talk about why that's the case, but you definitely want to know this. Short T1s are bright on T1 weighted images. Okay, so here's just an example of that MZ or longitudinal magnetization recovery for white matter and gray matter. They're pretty subtle, right? These are not big differences in T1, uh, and this is magnetization recovery along Z, so it only depends on T1. There's relatively subtle differences between the recovery paths for the Z magnetization between white matter and gray matter. Nevertheless, it's enough for us to generate meaningful and, and useful image contrast. And so typically, in this case, we're playing another saturation pulse, right? We're tipping white matter and gray matter down, and we're watching them recover. They recover at slightly different rates. And if I acquire an image, say, early, right here, I'll have very little image contrast. I won't see differences between white and gray matter. If I wait a long time, same problem. The amount of magnetization the difference between the two tissues is very similar. I can't really generate a high contrast image. So the trick again is in the timing. I want to time my experiment typically for maximum contrast. Uh, and so well, we'll talk about the timing tricks to do so, but that's the principle. What about T2 relaxation? Well, T2 relaxation we also refer to as transverse because it affects the MXY magnetization. Uh, so you want to link T2 and MXY together. And we also refer to this as, the chemists and physicists do at least, as spin-spin relaxation. And that's because it's related to the interaction of spins with other spins, right? There's billions of spins filling a little pixel, and they're all bumping and tumbling into each other. The rate at which they do that uh, affects their T2 relaxation. So it's related to spins interacting with spins. Um, typically, in terms of numbers, I think it's good to know this is on the order of like tens to maybe hundreds of milliseconds. So basically an order of magnitude factor of 10 lower than T1 time constants. Uh, again, not obvious, but we know this empirically that increasing molecular size decreases T2. Uh, large molecules have short T2s. Uh, fat uh, also has a short T2. Uh, So-called increasing molecular mobility will increase T2s. Liquids consequently have long T2s. Uh, they, they have a lot of molecular mobility. Water can move around a lot. And CSF or edema, uh, also sort of good examples of watery tissues, obviously, uh, they also have long T2s. Uh, furthermore, increasing molecular interactions uh, decreases T2. So if the molecules sort of had a lot of spin-spin interaction, then the T2 will tend to be shorter. Uh, an extreme example of that is solids, and this is one of the reasons, one of the principal reasons why we can't see things like ligament and tendon really well. They're watery or pretty watery tissues, 
uh, but because they're relatively solid, they have really short T2s, and the signals we want to detect decay away really quickly. We can't even get a good image out of them. I'll show you some, some mediocre examples of ligament and tendon imaging later. Uh, T2, interestingly, is relatively independent of B0. And so that thing I said about T1 depending on B0 a little bit, it goes up with B0, uh, T2 is actually relatively constant. Uh, you definitely want to remember T2 is always less than T1, right? These, there's an order to these things, and it's always the case that T2 will be less than T1. And even more importantly, long T2 is bright on a T2-weighted image. That doesn't maybe make sense yet, or maybe it does, depending on what you've sort of studied so far, but we're going to get into explaining this concept when we talk about spin echoes. But you want to remember that long T2 is bright on a T2-weighted image. Okay, so let's look at the transverse magnetization. Uh, and how it decays as a function of time for, say, white matter and gray matter. Well, it turns out that the time constants are, again, quite similar, uh, but they do have slightly different decay paths between the two tissue types, and the same principle sort of applies. In this case, I've played a saturation pulse again. I've taken my, my white matter and gray matter, I've tipped them both down, and that means they both have maximum transverse magnetization at that point in time. We don't quite understand exactly how we uh, do this yet from this course, but I could, I could form an image at different points during this decay process. And if I try to form an image early on, I'll get a bright image, but I won't have any contrast, right? This would be sort of proton density weighted. If I wait longer and longer and longer, I can start to eke out some differences between white matter and gray matter, and maybe form an image that uh, has sufficient contrast for whatever the diagnostic uh, task is. And so this is maybe a good time to form an image. If I wait too long, the signals, both of those signals have decayed and they've become so similar that I've lost contrast and I've lost signal and it won't be useful to me at all. We'll talk more about how this actually relates to image contrast uh, shortly. Okay, so sort of summarizing all of this, this comes from the, the Bushberg book. Uh, just if you want to kind of conceptually wrap your head around this, these are some governing principles, the ones I just covered about how T1 varies, how T2 varies as a function of things like molecular motion, molecular size, and molecular interactions. I don't think you have to memorize this by, by any sense, but it helps give you some intuition as to why certain tissues behave certain ways. And if you understood something about how CSF was behaving, you probably would be able to say, oh, I bet edema behaves similarly because molecularly those are both watery tissues. So that might help you in that sense. Uh, more concretely, we can just substitute out examples for these and describe, uh, we know, say, empirically, that muscle, for example, has a, a, a kind of intermediate T1 and uh, a short T2. And so that's maybe consistent with sort of being in this bin, whereas fat has a pretty, uh, inter has a, a larger and, say, uh, more intermediate or more in the middle T2, but an even shorter T1 than muscle. And then we can compare that on the far end to CSF, where the T1 is in fact getting, say, longer and longer, and the T2 is getting longer as well. So that, that you know, conceptually will help you understand some of why a tissue or what kind of T1 or T2 a tissue might have. Uh, it could be useful if, if, a, if a tissue for whom you hadn't memorized the T1 and T2, but they gave you a table of other values, you could say, oh, I bet this tissue is close to this other tissue. Okay. So image contrast, right? So this is what this lecture has been about so far, is how do we generate and, and, and get the image contrast that we want to. And hopefully at this point we recognize that uh, image contrast is a consequence, you know, mathematically at least, of the block equations. And it heavily, for the purposes of, of this course, uh, is going to depend on, say, T1 and T2. We'll talk about T2 star a little bit later, if that's something you've heard about already. Interestingly, uh, as a consequence of those equations, and I'll show you an example in just a second, but the bulk magnetization vector is not a constant magnitude. So I keep waving my arms around like bulk magnetization vectors, but I can actually, there are ways you can manipulate the bulk magnetization to get rid of it. You can basically null it and have it be zero. And so it's not sort of a classical vector maybe in that way. Uh, sometimes that throws people off a little bit. And what we'll see is that by manipulating the magnitude of the bulk magnetization, we can fundamentally generate image contrast and do some really interesting things. So let's go back to our RF pulses and, and spin gymnastics. I won't um, sort of belabor the point too much, but these are the expressions that we saw previously for the behavior of the longitudinal and transverse magnetization. 
And so this example here is showing you what happens to the bulk magnetization, the orange vector, after a 90 pulse. So I play a 90 pulse and I tip it down uh, to say there. So that's the immediate action of the RF pulse. After the RF pulse, it's simultaneously governed by both of these equations. MZ is recovering and MXY is shrinking. And so it sort of shrinks in towards the middle, but it also grows longer towards the top. So that's what I mean by it's not of constant magnitude. And eventually, 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 it returns back to that equilibrium position. So again, I play, I'll just play it through. That's the 90, whoops, let's see if we get this one going. It's chaos. Okay, that's the 90 pulse, and that's the path of magnetization recovery. Now, why is that interesting? Well, let's just move forward to a slightly different example. We go to the 135 pulse. I can tip past 90 degrees, and now it returns really close to the middle of the magnetization vector space. As it gets, when it's really close to this middle point here, its magnitude is quite low. Eventually, it returns back to its equilibrium point. Okay, why is that interesting? Well, in the extreme example of a 180, I can tip the magnetization over and it just recovers straight along the z-axis, okay? That might seem really strange. You, you might have expected that it was gonna tip over and then it was gonna have a transverse component again on the way back up, but it doesn't. Why? Well, the this equation here tells you that however much component you have after the RF pulse, it just decays, right? And in this example here, how much transverse magnetization do I have after the RF pulse? Zero. And so MXY zero, let me pause this. This term here, this leading term here is just zero, and zero is just decaying away, okay? So it's in the equations, right? Uh, what does it mean? Well, I can play, this is an inversion pulse. I can use an RF pulse to quickly invert my spin system. I can invert everything. I can invert white matter, gray matter, CSF, fat, they all see the same RF pulse. All of the spins would similarly get inverted. Now, during its return to equilibrium, I never get back an MXY component, right? And so the magnetization is kind of shrinking, shrinking, shrinking along that z-axis, and then eventually regrowing along the other uh, dimension or the other direction, if you will. So that's the path of the bulk magnetization uh, vector after an inversion pulse. Why is that interesting? Well, the rate at which it recovers, right, the rate at which it goes through this process here is going to be different for white matter, gray matter, CSF, and fat. And so this helps us manipulate image contrast because importantly, when the bulk magnetization vector is right at zero there, there's no way for me to generate signal for that particular tissue. And at this point in time, that's only one tissue that's going to be at its null point. Maybe it's white matter, maybe it's CSF. And so we'll see how this is a mechanism for generating what I call extreme image contrast, extreme T1 weighting in the image contrast. So let's look at some uh, um, sort of things taken together, and then we'll look at some more examples of how we use this for uh, creating images. So taken together, these are the trajectories of white matter, uh, sorry, gray matter and white matter uh, MZ magnetization, the solid lines, and MXY DK, uh, the dashed lines. And the point is that uh, we could, in principle, uh, after, say, playing the saturation pulse, we could acquire an image at any point in time. And the specifics of how we acquire the image and the timing of when we acquire the image will help us get T1 contrast if we do it in a particular way. Or, and it's not entirely obvious, we could get T2 contrast as well by timing the experiment in a slightly different way. Hopefully you'll see how this works uh, in just a little bit. Uh, the other thing we have to talk about is not just T1 and T2, but T2 star. And so let's go through that, and then uh, we uh, I'll look at my slides. We might take a short break at that point. Okay, so what's T2 star? T2 star is the observed transverse magnetization relaxation time constant. So T2 is sort of, uh, is sort of what's happening at the molecular level. T2 star is sort of a little bit uh, different than that. It's what we would observe. So it's a consequence of the same thing for T, as T2 uh, was dependent on, spin-spin interaction. And that spin-spin inter interaction actually causes dephasing, right? At the molecular level, it makes spins point in slightly different directions. Um, what does dephasing do to our signal intensity? Does it increase it or decrease it? We talked about this yesterday. Let's see in the back. It's going down, right? So as my spins are spreading out and fanning out, that's, that's bad for signal reception, right? Uh, they're dephasing. Well, some dephasing is unavoidable. Spins interact with spins, and we can't do anything about that. 
Uh, it's a molecular level event. So that interaction is what we refer to as being irreversible. Now, there are other possible mechanisms for dephasing, and we talked about this some yesterday. Within a voxel, so at the pixel level, if you will, there can be spin dephasing due to other things. So you can have spin dephasing because your B0 is inhomogeneous, or you can have spin dephasing because of so-called susceptibility differences. Susceptibility is a good word to, to know and remember. It's generally related to the fact that we have air spaces nearby the tissues that we care about, and those air spaces uh, change the local magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field uh, uh, properties or, or magnitude is, is different uh, in and near boundaries of like air and water. And that causes uh, the Larmor frequency to shift and can lead to dephasing. Okay, so intravoxel spin dephasing from off resonance, however, is reversible. So you have spins interacting with spins, can't do anything about it, and that gives us the so-called T2 relaxation. There may be other reasons for spin dephasing, sort of field-related reasons, and that kind of off-resonance is actually reversible. Uh, that's, in fact, the trick to what we call a spin echo. So a spin echo sequence uses a refocusing pulse. It will refocus sources of off-resonance and consequently be T2-dependent. Spin echo imaging is T2-dependent. But we can't get rid of this intravoxel dephasing from off resonance with gradient echoes. We haven't really talked about spin and gradient echoes yet, it's coming. Uh, but gradient echoes consequently are T2 star dependent. So when we form an image with gradient echoes, you have T2 star contrast. And you really have to remember the difference between spin echo giving you T2 contrast and gradient echo giving you T2 star contrast. We'll get into sort of the whys and hows of that uh, for spin echoes later today. Uh, the consequence of all of this, maybe no surprise, is T2 star is shorter than T2, right? We have some additional sources of off resonance. That's going to make T2, T2 star shorter than T2. Uh, so here's a simple example of two different uh, of white matters, T2 and T2 star. If T2 star is even shorter, uh, then the magnetization is going to decay even more rapidly. And so just remember that T2 star decay is more rapid than uh, sort of conventional or uh, just regular T2 decay. Okay, so let's try to conceptually link these things together. So on the left-hand side here, I'm going to show you uh, this picture. Of this is a voxel, and the voxel is full with a bunch of spins. Uh, and as those spins uh, uh, whiz past my coil, they generate a signal through Faraday's law of induction. I can pick up that signal, I can record it, and we're learning how that helps us form an image. Uh, so what happens for T2 decay? Well, those spins are wobbling around, or, or precessing rather, and as they precess, they're also shrinking in magnitude because of that spin-spin interaction, and that means that my signal amplitude is getting lower and lower and lower. So this signal is decaying as a function of T2 now. I still have that precessional behavior, it's swinging past my coil, but it's decaying as a function of T2. If I have T2 star decay, something a little bit different happens. My spins are actually going to fan out. They're going to dephase at the same time that they're shrinking, right? So now they're pointing in every which direction and they're shorter in magnitude. That signal is going to decay even more quickly. And so this is conceptually the difference between T2 decay and T2 star decay. T2 decay is just sort of shrinking. T2 star decay is shrinking plus dephasing. Okay, quickly. So uh, T2 star is greater than T2 is greater than T1? True or false? False, right? Other way around. T2, is the, T2 star is the shortest, right? T2 in the middle, T1 is the longest. Long T1s are bright on a T1 weighted image. How would you correct it? Yeah, short T1s are bright on a T1 weighted image. You have to remember that one. Uh, short T2s appear dark on a T2 weighted image. Yep, so short T2s, that means things, the signals decay really quickly, and things that decay really quickly are typically going to be dark. Uh, what's an example of a tissue with a short T2? What's that? Yeah, solids for sure, so like meniscus, tendon, ligaments have really short T2s, like microsecond T2s. Uh, kind of more in the more in the sort of conventional short range is maybe something like liver and muscle, uh, and then you get to really long things like CSF, for example. Okay, 
Uh, so here we go. T1 of CSF is greater than the T1 of gray matter. True, right? T1 of CSF is like the longest T1 that we basically encounter. So it's it's a good, again, I think it's good to, to remember fat and remember CSF and other stuff's in the middle. And you can pick your favorite. Uh, how about this? The T2 of liver is less than the T2 of fat. It's close. It's true. So liver's T2 is short. Fat's actually kind of intermediate T2. It's a little, a little even on the longer side. Okay. Uh, let me... Oh, so learning objectives, right. So these, again, I'm not going to go through these specifically in class because it, it takes a while. Uh, but I think from the information presented, you should be able to go back and kind of use these as ways to study and learn and think back about the material. I'd be, I'd be happy if you have questions on email or something like that to, uh, to take those questions. But this is a way I would use to go back and help me review and understand that material. Back. So what we'll talk about is contrast agents and then we'll get into spin echoes and every, everything goes well. We'll be done just short of nine. Um, I can't talk a whole lot faster. Okay, so contrast agents. So contra what are contrast agents used for? Well, principally to enhance image contrast in regions that are perfused by the contrast agent. Right? The contrast agent has to get there and or get to some surrounding tissues and thereby tell you that the contrast agent didn't get into this other thing, this tumor, this lymph node, whatever, and it sort of helps you emphasize, exaggerate the presence of the thing that you're looking for, whether that's the blood pool for angiography or lymph nodes in, in uh, sentinel cancer detection or uh, tumors in the brain or the liver, METs, whatever. Uh, lots of possibilities there. Uh, and consequently, lots of different contrast agents in a multi-billion dollar market of, of producing these things. Uh, amongst the most uh, widely used contrast agents in MR are the so-called gadolinium-based agents. Uh, gadolinium is a heavy metal that's uh, all by itself uh, uh, very toxic. Uh, and so these contrast agents involve gadolinium chelated to something super strong, right? Uh, such that the gadolinium stays bound to whatever that chelating agent is. And then there's different methods of excretion of those contrast agents. Um, why is gadolinium interesting? Well, for reasons that aren't uh, sort of easy to describe, and in fact not ones that I don't know well, gadolinium enhances relaxation. It promotes T1 relaxation. And short T1s are what on a T1 weighted image? Bright, right? So we usually want to make, so gadolinium based contrast agents will typically make things very bright. Uh, because they are T1 shortening uh, agents and typically administer just IV. Uh, it's hydrophilic, and so it's not going to cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's, uh, they're, they're, it's a blood pool agent, so it's mostly going to be in the blood, although it can extravasate into, uh, say, tumors and infarcts and, in fact, leak across, say, a leaky uh, blood-brain barrier. Uh, method of excretion is via the kidneys in a several hours. So these contrast agents are relatively short-lived uh, in the patients themselves. Uh, this agents or this class of agents are paramagnetic. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means there's a bunch of unpaired electrons. They actually increase the susceptibility. They actually increase the field very, very locally, like very, very locally. Uh, and water comes along and interacts with the gadolinium contrast agent and water is forced to relax by the presence of this agent and consequently it is a T1 shortening agent. There's a lot here about safety for these agents. I think the main thing to remember is that these agents are extremely safe, right? Tens of millions of doses given over dozens of years with very, very few and limited adverse events, but uh, it's worth uh, talking about it for a bit. So uh, several years ago, probably 10 years ago now, this agent uh, became associated with what's called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, and that resembles a scleromyxedema and a scleroderma. <laughs> uh, point being, uh, these agents in patients that had, it was ultimately associated with agents that had weaker chelators and patients that had poor kidney function. And now we basically screen all patients for kidney function uh, looking for GFRs, uh, conscientious of people with poor renal function, uh, and would maybe in, in those circumstances not administer a contrast agent or a gadolinium-based contrast agent to those patients. If they have good kidney function, these agents are, are entirely—I would—I wouldn't say entirely. These are very, very, very safe agents. 
And as a consequence of better screening of, of uh, kidney function, there's no newly reported cases of NSF in the past like seven or eight years or something like that. So it kind of was a thing. You might hear about it uh, because we understand it better now. It's not, uh, it's not likely uh, to, to be an issue so long as you're uh, looking at kidney function for patients. The other thing that's uh, come up a little bit more recently is actually uh, gadolinium deposition in the brain. And so it turns out that uh, so if you have multiple administrations of, the con of a gadolinium-based contrast agent, uh, small parts of your brain, substantia nigra, maybe something else, will remain uh, bright on a T1-weighted image weeks, days, months after administration of the contrast agent. So there's some deposition of this contrast agent in the brain. Uh, it's hard to believe it's homeopathic, but it's also not associated with anything. And so it's going to be in the background. If you do contrast enhanced MR, uh, this is going to be talked about probably for a very, very long time because it, it looks like it that wouldn't be a great thing, right? But it'll probably be proved incredibly difficult, if possible, to prove that there's any downside to that. But people will be monitoring that and trying to pay attention to it for a long, long time. Uh, so ultimately, very, very safe agents. Uh, what does a T1 shortening agent do? Well, we saw these T1 relaxation curves before, and so if I increase my dose of contrast, I give maybe no contrast, and then I give a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, my tissues that are perfused by that contrast agent will relax even more quickly. And short T1s are bright on a T1-weighted image, and so we can make tissues that have the presence of the contrast agent quite bright on a T1-weighted image. And that's the principle that underlies, say, using these agents for angiography. It's a blood pool agent, and you can get really bright blood pool uh, and therefore do angiography. Now, increasing the dose of a T1 shortening agent increases the available signal for MR imaging, but too much contrast is not only unsafe, it will ultimately compromise image quality. So it's not the case that just more and more contrast agent will make things brighter and brighter. Eventually, you kind of fall off a cliff. And really with doses that are like even just a couple times higher than normal, the image contrast falls off considerably. So I just don't want you thinking that, oh, well, I'll just give more contrast and my images will look brighter and better. And uh, it's simply not the case and it's unsafe. Uh, so here's some examples of just pre-contrast and post-contrast with a gadolinium-based contrast agent. These are from Dr. Finn, uh, who many of you have probably worked with. Uh, and the bottom line is you'll notice the, the very bright blood pool that's apparent on the right-hand side image relative to the left-hand image. It'll also enhance uh, or reduce the T1 of just general parenchyma, right, tissues perfused with that contrast agent. Uh, that's just a little less obvious in the images, whereas the blood pool becomes substantially brighter. And then you can do all kinds of things uh, in terms of post-processing, uh, either uh, MIPS, where you subtract the pre- and post-contrast image and do a maximum intensity projection, rotate things around and get a, a, a quite good view or overlay of the vascular architecture. Or you can do more fancy things like uh, volume rendering, in this case, I think, is a co-arc, just the, the aorta. Uh, so that's the, the, the sort of mechanisms and, and possible uses behind it. Uh, more recently, especially here at UCLA, you might hear about furamoxetol or ferahim. Uh, uh, Paul Finn's also uh, sort of a big clinical advocate of the use of this agent. It's actually uh, also a T1 shortening agent. It's administered IV as well. It's hydrophilic, so it also doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's quite small in its size. This agent is an intravascular agent with no kidney excretion and a very long half-life. So you can administer this agent and it'll be present in the, in the patient for you know, days, right, with a 14-hour half-life. Uh, so there's some interesting consequences of that. A patient could come back a day later for a follow-up and you wouldn't have to give the contrast agent again, or unlikely that you would have to. Um, what is the agent itself? Well, it's an ultra-small, super paramagnetic iron oxide agent. Uh, and so it's iron-based, and so that's thought to be a little bit more benign than some of these heavier metals. Uh, but it does still have some, some known side effects. Uh, and this construction or this chemistry develops strong internal magnetization in a B0 field. And again, water has to interact with the contrast agent. You have billions and billions of water molecules. They have to come up and be molecularly adjacent to your contrast agent. And when that happens, uh, they're sort of forced to relax uh, quickly. And consequently, they're T1 shortening agents. Um, there was some interesting safety, sorry, I think got bunched up at the bottom here. There's some interesting safety associated with this agent. Uh, all IV iron products carry a risk, obviously, of uh, certain allergic reactions. Uh, 
Ferahim is actually uh, specifically approved for use only in adults with iron deficiency anemia. So all use in MR is off-label, uh, and most uses of the gadolinium agents are off-label as well. I forget what it's actually approved for. They're widely used, but mostly in the off-label sense. Uh, and because of some recent sort of uh, problems with dosing and hypotension and some mild aller allergic reactions, these agents are administered IV with a slow infusion over about 15 minutes, whereas the gadolinium-based agents could be given as just a bolus injection of uh, over you know, 10 or 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds, something like that. So again, widely safe agent. This is more of an emerging field, uh, but I think it's something that uh, as, as uh, emerging practicing radiologists, you'll probably hear more and more and more about. Uh, so these are some just nice images from, from Paul's lab for uh, imaging congenital heart disease. And again, this agent is a blood pool agent. So what you're seeing here is changes in vascular structures over time uh, and the contraction of the right ventricle and the left ventricle, really sort of mind-bending stuff uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, really exciting in the field of MR right now. Uh, there are other agents as well. There are so-called SPIO agents, so not ultra-small, but just small. So the agent size is slightly larger. Uh, these are so-called T2 star shortening agents. So the other agents we saw affected T1. This agent in particular affects T2 star uh, more so. Also hydrophilic, uh, also an intravascular uh, uh, contrast agent that's taken up by the mononuclear phagocyte system and then the liver and then the spleen. There's no kidney extraction or excretion rather for uh, this agent. And it has a kind of intermediate half-life. Uh, it's super paramagnetic. It's not ultra small, but it also does the same thing and develops these strong internal magnetization that forces spins to relax if, if water molecules come into short molecular distances of the contrast agent itself. Um, the safety of these things is generally the same. All very, very safe agents, but hypotension, allergic reactions, and so forth are always possible. And the idea between, behind a T2 star shortening agent is that the T2 itself can get shorter and shorter and shorter. So tissues that have the presence of this contrast agent will, be, will end up uh, appearing quite dark. Uh, and so it's sort of a, sometimes called a negative contrast agent as opposed to a positive contrast agent like the gadolinium-based agents, which make things very, very bright. Uh, so here's an example of using uh, feromoxide SPIO uh, uh, agent. And the consequence here is on the pre-contrast image of the liver, the, this is the T1-weighted image, the liver intensity is relatively flat, maybe uninteresting, uh, relatively uniform. By administering this agent, it's a T2 star shortening agent, it gets into the parenchyma of the liver, causes the liver signal to darken. Uh, the contrast agent does not get into the, the tumor here and makes the tumor uh, stand out more. You have better contrast between background tissue uh, and the tumor itself. So again, this is a, a, a negative contrast agent that in this case is used to make the liver look dark relative to a, a, a hepatic nodule. Okay, so a quick uh, quiz on uh, contrast agents. Gadolinium-based agents act to lengthen T1. True or false? False, right? Shortens T1. SPIO agents can increase lesion conspicuity. Seems reasonable, right? That was the liver case we just uh, showed you. MRI contrast agents are widely considered very safe. Yeah. I mean, I think you should always sort of know the issues there uh, and stay attuned of those things. Uh, but yes, these are really safe agents. Okay, so moving right along, uh, we've talked a lot about contrast and manipulating contrast. We haven't talked that much about sort of signals and how do we actually acquire and, and make images. And so uh, the rest of this lecture, the next kind of 30, 40 minutes, is going to be spent on uh, developing the concept of spin echoes and contrast and spin echo images. Uh, not so much image formation. We'll get to uh, Fourier transforms and case space. Uh, I know you're excited to get to that, but we're going to wait maybe another day or two before we get to the really heavy stuff. Okay, so one of the most basic MR signals that we have is the so-called free induction decay. We'll talk about this quickly. It's good to know what it is, but we don't really use it for MR very much. Why is it called the free induction decay? It's free because it's the signal that arises from precession of the bulk magnetization about B0 right after an RF pulse. So we talk about tipping the spins into the transverse plane. That's forced precession. Uh, RF pulses force the magnetization to do something. And after that, we had the block equations that described what the magnetization was going to do freely after that. 
the free induction decay is basically the first thing that happens and it's freely processing after the RF pulse. It's induction because it's Faraday's law of induction. We can pick up that signal in a nearby coil and it decays because we know the amplitude of that signal is going to shrink over time. We have T2 decay, T2 star decay uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, the characteristics, uh, good to know, its amplitude is maximum right after the RF pulse, and that makes sense. I take my magnetization, I tip it down, that's the most I'm ever going to get, and then it's going to decay after that, depending on things like T2, T2 star. Okay, so what's the experiment? Well, this is one of your first uh, pulse sequences, right? MR is, is, is fraught with pulse sequences. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, the RF pulse is a 90 degree pulse. I'm gonna play a 90 degree pulse that will generate some transverse magnetization. It'll process in the transverse plane. I'll be able to pick that up with my nearby coil, but it also decays over time. And that decay mostly depends on like T2 star, which is T2 plus those field inhomogeneities. This is also a so-called one-sided signal. When we get to echoes, that'll make a little bit more sense, but echo signals are, are two-sided. They look like this plus sort of a reflection of itself. Okay, so that's, that's the source origin and kind of what the free induction decay is. That signal is going to decay very quickly and, and, and uh, uh, some of those losses are reversible. And we'll talk about those reversible losses when we get to the spin echo sequence, which is four or five slides down the road. Uh, so what about the free induction decay? Well, it's not commonly used in the clinic. There's some sort of cutting edge things that people are trying to do. They're most likely going to have application in MSK where there's a lot of tissues with really short T2s, ligament, tendon, um, meniscus, cartilage. Uh, those things are just typically harder to see. Uh, what's it used for? Well, it's used for ultra short echo time imaging of very short T2 species. So the things I just talked about. And in fact, uh, there's some reasons and applications for like rad onc and so forth where imaging bones could be really useful for treatment planning, obviously for MSK, limit, ligaments, tendons, uh, meniscus and so forth would be, it'd be nice if you had better uh, conspicuity for those tissues. Um, spin echoes and gradient echoes are uh, other methods that are in fact probably are, are by far the most widely used methods for generating images. And these images here, these are really sort of more research oriented image of showing how it's possible with very specialized methods to use the FID and generate better signal intensities in, uh, in tendon, for example. Okay, so that's enough about the FID. What we really care about is echoes. Echoes are the fundamental and most central signals for MR that we acquire. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, so, uh, but we'll talk about it more right now. So what are echoes? Well, echoes are so-called two-sided NMR signals. And the first half comes from so-called refocusing and the second half comes from dephasing. So remember, right after a 90 pulse, I generate an FID. But this signal decays quickly enough that it's hard for me to, to, to produce a useful and interesting image. And I don't even have a chance yet to sort of introduce or add these concepts of T1 weighting and T2 weighting and so forth. The echo signal, and it's not obvious yet, but the echo signal can be formed later. I play a 90 degree pulse, the signal decays. Some of that decay is reversible. And echoes uh, take advantage of being able to reverse some of that signal loss and actually generate a signal at a delayed time. We're echoing, right? Energy in, wait a little bit, and the energy comes back out under the right conditions. Not, a, not obvious, but I'll help you understand those conditions. Spin echoes, importantly, arise from multiple RF pulses. Uh, we saw some examples of this yesterday, right? The classic spin echo sequence is a 90 degree pulse, and then later we play the refocusing pulse, that was the pancake flipping pulse, and that will help us form an echo. Uh, so it's the consequence of multiple RF pulses. Another possibility is gradient echoes. We'll talk about those next week. Gradient echoes arise from using uh, magnetic field gradients and actually turning them sort of on positive and then turning them on negative or reversing them. Uh, we'll get to uh, uh, talking about gradient echoes later. And importantly, I think a good thing to remember is an echo helps us fill a line of K-space. Uh, if you've studied MR even a little bit, you've probably heard of the dreaded K-space. Uh, K-space is the domain in which we actually acquire imaging data. And with some mathematical processing, importantly a Fourier transform, we go from the acquired data to a useful image. Uh, we'll talk a fair bit about K-space uh, probably in the next lecture, uh, which is next week.
But remember that an echo helps us fill a line of k-space. I think that's a, a really key concept. Okay, so why so why echoes? Let me back up here just a second. So why echoes? Well, the free induction decay, we saw this earlier, that decays really rapidly, and within hundreds of microseconds, that signal is effectively gone. And if it's gone, we can't use it for usefully forming an image. Imaging also requires certain delays. Now, we haven't talked about all of these delays, but there's lots of things associated with spatial encoding, right? We have to turn gradients on, we have to turn gradients off, and that takes you know, many milliseconds at least to do so. And I refer to those as delays. There are things that we need to do if we want to form images, but they are delays. Uh, and so we could play a 90 pulse. This FID is going to rapidly decay. We have some imaging gradients that we have to play. And if we do things just right, we can form this echo at a slightly later time. And that's the really useful thing that uh, conceptually comes out of spin echo and gradient echo imaging. And so the bottom line is that this echoes let us buy some time. They let us do a few things that we need to do so that we can form a useful image. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, pulse sequences because this will be important for when we talk about spin echoes, which is coming up, and then later for gradient echoes. Uh, the general idea of a, so what is a pulse sequence? Well, a pulse sequence describes a series of RF pulses and gradients needed to produce a specific MR image. So we have dozens, hundreds of different pulse sequences on the scanner, and it's the strength and weakness of MR, right? It's complicated, but it's complicated because it has extraordinary flexibility. So it takes a lot of expertise to run these machines, to do these reads, like it's hard, right? What is a pulse sequence? Well, it's the set of instructions, right? I have sheet music in the background there, right? It's a set of instructions that tells the gradient or tells the MR system what to do, what to play. And we talk about playing RF pulses and playing gradients. And we have to do those in a very specific uh, timing order uh, to produce the image contrast that we're interested in. In general, we have some kind of contrast module, meaning we do something to prepare the magnetization. We can emphasize T1 weighting this way or emphasize T2 weighting this way or perfusion, diffusion, all kinds of things. And that's followed in general by some imaging module. So we prepare the magnetization, we do something to it, and then we get a snapshot of it, right? Now in reality, sometimes these things really merge and kind of blur together, but conceptually it's useful to think about generating contrast and then getting a snapshot of the magnetization to form your image. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the contrast module can be different things, saturation recovery, we saw a little bit about inversion recovery, uh, we haven't yet talked about T2 prep, but that's a possibility. And when it comes to imaging, we can do the imaging in different ways. We can do the imaging with spin echoes or what are called fast spin echo techniques, or we can do it with gradient echoes or spoiled gradient echo techniques. The two main categories of imaging approaches are spin echoes and gradient echoes. And there'll be some distinctions you'll want to pick up on uh, between those. That'll, the distinctions will come up more in the, I think it's the third lecture. Sometimes we call this the host sequence. Okay, so FIDs and echoes. FID signals persist for many seconds. False, right? Hundreds of microseconds, right? They're gone very quickly. Uh, FID imaging is widely used in MSK. False, right? We still don't really use FID imaging. It, there's, there's some intriguing possibilities, but it's not, I would say, not there yet. Uh, echoes bias time and enable imaging. True. Imaging produces a snapshot of the state of the transverse magnetization. True. That's, ex I mean, it's, it, that's not maybe obvious, but it's definitely true, right? We're doing something to generate transverse magnetization. We're only sensitive to detecting transverse magnetization with our coil, and we do, in fact, get some kind of snapshot of that magnetization. Now, there was a side conversation at the break about, well, if you only measure transverse magnetization, isn't that all T2? Uh, you know, related? And the answer is no, of course, because we know we can get T1 and T2 related, uh, or T2, T1 and T2 weighted images. And the trick is basically that we can manipulate the longitudinal magnetization, and when it reaches a state that we care about because of an inversion pulse or something like that, we quickly make it transverse magnetization and take a picture. So we'll, we'll, you'll see how that sort of comes together when we talk about spin echoes, but we can, we can create we can manipulate the magnetization, but we always measure the transverse magnetization. Okay, so finally, right, spin echo imaging. How does this work? 
Uh, let's talk quickly about advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages here are that it's largely insensitive to sources of off resonance, right? Off resonance were things that cause the magnetic field to be other than the, the B0 field that we usually uh, want it to be. Uh, the reason for that is these so-called refocusing pace, uh, pulses. Uh, uh, refocusing pulses, this should say rephase, uh, spin dephasing uh, due to several sources of off resonance. The B0 field's not perfect. We can have chemical shift, fat and water do slightly different thing, or susceptibility differences. Air adjacent to water causes field shifts in the watery tissue that we maybe care about. Uh, so lots of sources of off resonance can be rephased using a refocusing pulse conceptually. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. It's great, as you'll see in a second, for T1, T2, or proton density weighted contrast, sometimes uh, called rho uh, weighted imaging, usually proton density. Uh, it's not good for T2 star, right? Uh, if you know a little bit about MR already, then you know that if we want T2 star weighted images, we have to use gradient echoes, right? So T2 goes with spin echoes, T2 star goes with gradient echoes. Uh, great sequence, bread and butter thing, uh, good high signal to noise. Some disadvantages, you'll see what this looks like. Uh, this will make a little bit more sense in a second maybe, but there's always disadvantages. One is that the TR can be long. Uh, the TR is the time between excitation pulses, right? So we play an excitation pulse, we tip and generate transverse magnetization. Maybe we refocus and then we wait for it to recover. How long we wait before playing another uh, excitation pulse, we call the TR. TR stands for the repetition time. If your TR is long, that means it takes you a long time to acquire an echo, and we need dozens, hundreds of echoes to generate images. So if our TR is long, we fill case space very slowly, and it takes a while to generate the image. Uh, the other thing is that the SAR can be high. What was the SAR? You guys remember yesterday talking about SAR? What's it related to? Energy deposit of the patient. Watts per kilogram, so how much we're heating up patients. When we play big RF pulses, 90 degree pulses, 180 degree pulses, those are high in SAR. Uh, a few of those, no problem. Thousands of those, you're going to heat up your patient. And so the SAR for these sequences can be high, and then it just has to be uh, mitigated in different ways. Okay, so this we saw before. This is the free induction decay. We play a 90. We generate some transverse magnetization. It decays really quickly for a bunch of different reasons. Some of this, however, is reversible. Some of those losses are reversible because they arose from off resonance, which is kind of this macro thing, rather than sort of the spin-spin interaction, which is a very molecular level micro thing. And so the magic of the spin echo sequence is playing this 90 degree pulse and then playing a 180 pulse. And the 180 pulse is the pancake flip, right? We're gonna tip the magnetization down into the transverse plane. It's gonna dephase some, and then we can flip it over with a 180, and you'll see how the magnetization actually can be rephased to form a strong echo. And so as the echo is forming, it's a two-sided, you know, sort of symmetric signal, and those reversible components are rephasing. As the reversible stuff goes away, we get a nice strong signal in the middle, but those same sources of off resonance actually continue to push things out of phase, and the signal then decays again. So this is sort of, in principle, what the echo signal sort of looks like, if you will. And there's some really key parameters here that we have to remember. We talked about the TR uh, already. The TR is the time from 190 pulse to a subsequent excitation pulse or subsequent 90 pulse. And we control this on the scanner. When you, when you build a pro, a, your MSK protocol, your neuro protocol, your spine protocol, whatever, you're going to build a protocol that has the TR that you want. And we're going to talk about how you pick your TR in just a second. But the TR is the time between the 90 pulses, the time from excitation to the next excitation. Uh, the TE is the time from the 90 pulse to the middle of the echo. We call it the echo time, or just the TE. And we can also control, manipulate the echo time by adjusting MR parameters. So you have to remember what the TR is. You have to remember what the echo time is. Uh, that signal does decay. The signal here uh, that we have available at the very, very beginning uh, is going to decay by the time we form an echo. So the echoes aren't sort of the maximum possible magnetization. And the amount of decay is going to depend on T2 and how long we waited for. In this case, we waited a time TE. And so the signal would be a function of E to the minus TE over T2 because that's how long we waited. The echo is forming at time uh, TE. So the question is, how do you adjust the TR? 
Well, on the scanner, you just type in a number, right? You say 1,000 milliseconds or 5,000 milliseconds. Behind the scenes, all that's doing is saying, okay, I'm going to play a 90 pulse, and I'm going to wait as long as the user told me to wait. I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to play another 90 pulse until 1,000 milliseconds later or 5,000 milliseconds later or whatever was dictated by the protocol that you set up. Another question is how do you adjust the TE? Well, the TE, the time when the echo forms here, depends entirely on when you play the 180 pulse. If I play the 180 pulse a lot earlier, then my echo will form even earlier. The 180 pulse uh, occurs, uh, we, we, we pick the timing of it, but it occurs exactly in the middle of the 90 and the peak of the echo, right? And as I move the 180 around, I can move when my echo uh, will form itself. I'll show you some, some pictures of how this all happens in just a second. Uh, in fact, right now. So we saw this a little bit yesterday. This is the classic spin echo sequence, a really nice uh, animation that's just uh, poached from Wikipedia. And so here, what we imagine is, uh, uh, this is a, a tissue of interest, right? It's some little region of interest. It's a pixel, maybe. And we have a bunch of bulk magnetization that's at equilibrium and pointing straight up and down. The first thing that happens in the spin echo sequence is the 90 pulse. And so the, all the magnetization in that region that we are observing here is tipped down into the transverse plane, right? Now, imagine each of these bulk magnetization vectors is at a slightly different location in my pixel, right? They're not identically at the same place. And as a consequence of many and several sources of off resonance, they'll drift a little bit from the Larmor precession. Everything's processing at the Larmor frequency, 64 megahertz. We don't demonstrate this here, but everything's a little bit off from the Larmor frequency because the field is a tiny bit different at every location. And as a consequence, those spins spread out. Right? Some are processing a little bit more quickly, some are processing a little bit more slowly, all because of different sources of off resonance. So the trick, the real magic behind the spin echo sequence is what happens with the 180 pulse. This 180 pulse here, uh, again, I keep saying it, flips everything over like a pancake. I play the 180 and I flip everything over like a pancake. Now if you want to understand why that's a 180, uh, have a uh, picture your, your thumbs sort are of wrapping around those vectors and pointing straight up. And as I tip over with a 180, it's the same as tipping my thumb upside down. Okay? So the bulk magnetization, if there was a Z vector here, that Z vector would flip over like a pancake and be pointing up and down. So it is 180 degrees of flipping, if you will. Uh, now, those same sources of off resonance, right? They haven't gone away, they're still there. Spins are still in the same location. Those same sources of off resonance, because you've flipped things over, those same sources of off resonance actually push the spins together again. And as they get pushed together, that's when they form the echo. That's when I get my maximum signal. But those same sources of off resonance not only cause things to rephase, they keep going, right? And now they cause things to dephase, right? And so the magic of the 180 is that you flip everything over, the same sources of off resonance push the spins together until the maximum uh, echo uh, peak here. But again, those same sources cause those, those spins to continue dephasing. So there's really a very short period of time where the spins are in alignment with one another and giving me a really strong uh, MR signal. Questions about sort of how the sequence comes together? So that's, the, that's this, what we call the spin gymnastics of what's happening, right? That doesn't give you a lot of insight as to how uh, we get image contrast, the image contrast that we want. But this gives you some insight as to uh, why that refocusing pulse gives us immunity, if you will, to sources of off resonance. Okay, so how do we get, how do we get contrast in the spin echo image? Well, there's a bunch here, and, and there's a bunch here that you, you really do probably need to remember. Uh, you'll remember first off that spin echoes are good for generating spin density weighted images or proton density weighted images, T1 or T2 star weighted images, uh, T2 weighted images, not T2 star weighted images. To get these specific kinds of image weightings, we have to pick our TE and we have to pick our TR appropriately. The flip angle that we use is almost always going to be the 90-180 pair. That's the hallmark, if you will, of the spin echo sequence. This expression here, a little bit complicated, but it dictates the, sig the, the echo amplitude for a particular tissue. So a particular tissue's signal intensity. It's going to depend on the T1, it's going to depend on the T2, and it's going to depend on the proton density. Those are tissue-specific parameters, right? The things that you and I can change when we go sit at the scanner include the TR 
and the TE, right? We can make these adjustments. And by making adjustments to TR and TE, we can do what we said was our original goal at the very beginning of this lecture. How do we make the amplitude of the echo depend just on proton density weighting, for example? Uh, this expression, I should have said, falls out of the Bloch equations. It's not an obvious thing, but that's where it comes from. It comes from the Bloch equations and governs the amplitude of the echo. So let's say I want to generate a proton density weighted image. That means, what do, I, what do I want to happen to this term here? Do I want it to go to 1 or do I want it to go to 0? 1, right? If it goes to 0, I'm, I'm dead, right? This whole thing multiplies to 0. So how do I get this term to look like a 1? What kind of TE do I need? What's e to the minus what is 1? 0, right? So if my echo time is 0 or short, really, really short, then this term becomes 1. Okay, so that means I don't have a contribution to my signal that depends on T2. That seems good in terms of if I want a proton density weighted image. So now I have to look at this other term here. I also want this whole term to go to 1. If I want this whole term to go to 1, then I need this exponential term to go to what? 0, right? How do I get an exponential to go to 0? What does my TR need to be? Short or long? long, right? Really long. I want this, to, this term to decay. And so if I have a really short TE and a really long TR, this term is 1, this term is 0, and all I'm really left with is proton density. And I now have a proton density weighted image. How do I do that sort of, uh, sort of numerically? Well, a short TE is kind of a 10 to maybe 30 milliseconds. And a long TR is more than 2,000 milliseconds, maybe even 5 or 10,000 milliseconds long, right? And if I pick, and I can do this on the scanner, pick a short TE with a long TR, I will get a spin density weighted image. Why? Because this equation, which falls out of the block equations, tells me I should have a spin density weighted image. Now you can go through the same exercise for T1 weighted, T2 weighted, uh, and you'll get the different solutions to this. Now, I think it's useful to have ballpark numbers in mind for TEs and TRs. More typically, these things are referred to as just being short or long. I also like using the term intermediate because I find just referring to things as short long and short short uh, not quite uh, distinctive enough. So you can compare this to sort of other sort of texts that, that develop this material, but they'll sometimes just use short and long and not the term intermediate. Uh, okay, so these are just some examples on the bottom here. Sorry, it's building a little bit funny. But if I want to get a T2 weighted image, you can see uh, this explains at least why a long TR will minimize this term and why an intermediate T term will emphasize uh, this term. And so by having a long TR and an intermediate TE, I'll get T2 weighting instead of proton density weighting. And then you can work through a third example here with T1 weighting. So I think this is a good slide if you really want to understand why we can generate a certain kind of contrast. Uh, if you don't really want to know the whyness of it, then at least remember this, this uh, table of sort of parameters up here that tell you that you need a, a short TE and an intermediate TR to get T1 weighted images, for example. Okay, so uh, here's just a simple example of, of sort of changing those parameters, having the TE go from short to long having the TR going from short to long, and we can generate in this sort of corner a T1 weighted image, a proton density weighted image, or a T2 uh, weighted image. We don't uh, typically use this image contrast here for, for anything that I uh, am aware of. Uh, you would have a long TE and a short TR, and you'd have kind of noisy T1, T2 weighted images. Uh, I don't think they're uh, diagnostically uh, useful or used for anything. Okay. So this is again uh, similar to that diagram we showed you just a second ago with one small change. So the spin echo sequence starts with a 90, tip all my magnetization over. Sources of off resonance cause things to have slightly different Larmor frequencies and drift apart from one another. The 180 flips everything over like a pancake and those same sources of off resonance now push things together until they form an echo and I get a nice strong signal. Same source of off resonance will push things sort of to dephase uh, subsequent to this as well. What's new in this one is I can change the timing of my 180, and as I move my 180 to be later and later and later and later, the echo amplitude that I'll form will be smaller and smaller and smaller, right? 
And that's the principle of T2 waiting. I can delay the timing of my 180. I delay when my echo will form. And if I'm delaying when my echo will form, uh, tissues uh, will be decaying more as a function of T2. That may or may not be what you want. It's a way of emphasizing T2 differences when you have longer and longer TEs or longer and longer echo times. So I think a nice example of how that uh, works. Okay, so let's look at some actual images here. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll get through spin echo imaging and we'll talk about two flavors of that and we should be done in maybe 15, 10 minutes. Uh, okay, so here are some images that we acquired. This is 90, 180, and we form an echo right away. So short TE with a long TR. This image has kind of flat image contrast. What kind of image is it? What would you call it? Spin echo. What, what kind of weighting does it have? Short TE, long TR. Proton density weighting, okay? And so short TE means you don't have much T2 effect, and a long TR means you don't have much T1 effect. You're left with proton density weighting. Now behind the scenes, you as users can change the TE and the TR. We can move the TE, uh, we can move the 180 out, form the echo later, and our contrast becomes a little bit more T2 weighted. And we can keep moving this out, move the 180 out, form the echo later, move the 180 out again, again, and you can see that the image contrast is, is changing. It's, it's developing. It's almost like developing film, right? The longer I wait, the more the contrast becomes apparent in this particular image. And the idea here, again, is that I've kept my TR fixed, but I'm changing my TE, and I'm, getting much, uh, I'm, getting, I'm going from a proton density weighted image to a heavily T2 weighted image. On a heavily T2 weighted image, uh, what's bright over here? Y is bright. It's CSF. Why is CSF bright? Does it have a long T2 or a short T2? Long, right? So long T2 things, they just hang out. They just stay bright. They don't decay very quickly. Short T2 things, uh, say white matter, gray matter, uh, have much shorter T2 compared to CSF, and you can see the brain parenchyma is just basically getting darker and darker and darker. So this is the the sort of mechanism or method behind how we can adjust, in this case, T2 uh, weighted contrast uh, with a spin echo sequence. Okay, so the uh, true falses. The 9180 pair is the hallmark of the spin echo sequence. Yes, right? That's, that's how you know it. It's a 9180, it's a spin echo. There's, ver there's flavors of spin echoes, but it's spin echo. Uh, the 180 pulse is an inversion pulse. We didn't exactly talk about this. Uh, MR people like to make a distinction between an inversion pulse and a refocusing pulse. And I tried to convince you that if I had a Z thing and I flipped over my pancake that it looks like an inversion pulse. It is kind of. It is 180 degrees, but more, um, more precisely we call it a refocusing pulse. And it turns out behind the scenes there are differences between inversion pulses and refocusing pulses. So you want to think of the spin echo sequences using uh, the, the the plain spin echo sequences using uh, a refocusing pulse. Uh, not to confuse you, but you can use inversion pulses before a spin echo to change contrast, and we'll talk about that actually right after this. So you'll you'll see an example of that. <laughs> uh, the 180 pulse is a refocusing pulse in the spin echo. Yeah, I would call that false. Correct. Sorry. Uh, okay, so spin echoes are ultra-fast sequences that provide T1 or T2 star-weighted images. I'd say false for two reasons, right? Are they ultra-fast? Not really, right? They're pretty fast, but I wouldn't call them ultra-fast. We'll see gradient echoes later. That's, that's getting fast. Maybe ultra-fast. Uh, are, are spin echo sequences, can they produce T1 weighting? Yes. Yep. Uh, can they produce T2 star weighting? Not really, right? They're really a T2 weighted imaging uh, approach. Uh, so let's say I want a T2 weighted image. Um, I need a long TE and a long TR for T2 weighting. Yeah, I would say false. Uh, long TE or maybe intermediate TE, depending on which book you read, uh, and definitely a long TR. Uh, if you didn't pick up on it on the previous slides, the long TR minimizes the T1 contribution. 
And so that's why we use a long TR for a T2 weighted image. We don't want T1 to, to play a role, so we need a long TR. Uh, short TE and short TR for T1 weighted images. Again, it depends on exactly how you, how you want to read these things. Uh, a lot of books would say, yes, that's fine. I would say it's a short TE and kind of an intermediate TR, uh, but short, short gives you pretty close to a T1 weighted image. Okay, and then last one, spin echoes are low SAR sequences. True or false? False. Why? 90s and 180s, right? Lots of RF pulses. Uh, and they can, it doesn't mean they have to be high SAR sequences, but they tend to be higher SAR sequences, more likely uh, risk of heating patients. Okay, I think we only have kind of a handful of slides here. Learning objectives, you can use these for review uh, or ask me questions about those later. Um, what we'll talk about quickly now is the inversion recovery spin echo sequence. Uh, the inversion recovery sequence actually uses an inversion pulse to manipulate contrast as part of the so-called contrast module. Uh, so there is the inversion recovery. And the imaging module that we'll care about or talk about today is spin echo. So here you actually see the combination of an inversion pulse to manipulate contrast, and then the spin echo, which uses the 90 and a refocusing pulse. So you'll see an inversion pulse and a refocusing pulse. How does this work? Well, we saw inversion pulses previously. We're going to invert the magnetization, and it's going to recover, according to the block equations, just directly along that z-axis. If we perfectly invert it, we don't get back a transverse component. And that's, uh, to me, really interesting and, and kind of fascinating. Uh, how is that useful? Well, here's an expression, again, falls out of the block equations, that tells us how the signal intensity is governed by proton density, T1, uh, uh, and proton density and T1. Here we don't see any contribution from T2 in particular. And then there's things that we can control. You can control your TR, right, as a user, and you can control what's called the inversion time. And I'll show you wh what that time means in just a second. Uh, so in this case, the inversion recovery signal depends on uh, two things that we control, the TI and the TR, and then, it can, and then it depends on the tissue property, which is just, of course, inherent to the tissue. Um, we saw how the magnetization can go through some null point. And so it's useful to know that the TI, uh, if you want to null a particular tissue, and you're going to see how this is useful for nulling fat or nulling CSF in just a second. We can null fat, we can null CSF if, we, if our TI is set to natural log two times T1. Natural log of two is like 0.69. So 70% of your T1, if you use that as your TI, you'll be able to null or come close to nulling a particular tissue that falls out of that math. Uh, what are the key features here? Well, it's a great contrast module for emphasizing T1 contrast. You can use uh, any imaging module. You could acquire the image with, an Im with a spin echo or a gradient echo. I'm gonna show you doing this with spin echoes. Uh, and the signal at the time of imaging is dependent on the T1 and the TI. We talked about that already. And the IR, this inversion recovery sequence, or using this inversion pulse, helps us emphasize or even exaggerate T1-based contrast. Uh, TR for the sequence is typically long, like uh, sorry, thousands of milliseconds, 2,000, maybe 5,000 or longer. And so that means, in, in ways we haven't gotten to yet, that it's better for so-called 2D sequences. Uh, and we want to keep the TE pretty short, typically. Uh, more intermediate or long TEs start introducing T2 contrast, and the inversion pulse is really there for emphasizing uh, T1 uh, contrast. Okay, so we saw this rule a second ago. I can pick my TI. What's the TI? The TI is I'm going to invert my spins, and then I'm going to wait to do my imaging, right? I'm developing the image contrast that I want by inverting everything, and then waiting the right amount of time before capturing my image. If I wait 0.7 times the T1, that particular T1 will be very dark, if not completely dark. So there's different approaches to this. Uh, if we know that fat uh, has a T1 of about 260 milliseconds, then 0.7 times 260 is 180. If I invert and wait 180 milliseconds, I'll have fat very dark in my images. And that's a sequence that we call short tau inversion recovery. It's very widely used for just a lot of body imaging applications, neuro, MSK. Uh, and this is, stands for sometimes also called short time inversion recovery. I'll show you what it looks like in a second. What if you want to null CSF, sort of the other end of the spectrum, right? 
Well, CSF has a really long T1. So 0.7 times the T1 of CSF gives me about 1600 milliseconds. If I invert my spins, say I'm doing neuroimaging, I invert my spins. If I wait 1600 milliseconds, the signal from CSF will be very, very dark because it's so slow to invert. It reaches its null point only after about 1600 milliseconds. But if I then form an image at that point in time, I'll have a CSF suppressed image, uh, also called flare. So stir and flare are, are typically flavors of spin echo imaging that use inversion pulses also. Uh, you can use this for T1 mapping. That's sort of more of an emerging topic, but some techniques now are being used to, and developed to actually measure the T1 of different tissues. Okay, so this is what the inversion recovery sequence looks like. I can take my magnetization, it was originally up here, and I can invert everything. Now the magnetization is going to recover according to the uh, T1 of the different tissues. So in this case, white matter and gray matter kind of separate out a little bit because uh, they have different T1 times. Now, something to remember in MR is that MR images typically, and by typically I mean anything you guys are going to see, uh, are magnitude images, or in fact, absolute value images. So even though I inverted my magnetization and I could take a picture sort of at any point in time during this recovery process, I'm not really sensitive to, to, to knowing that it was negative magnetization. We only really look at the magnitude. And that means the curves actually look a little bit more like this, the curves that we observe in our images. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind as well. And what that means is that there will be a time point, what we sometimes call the signal bounce, a time point here where you're very, very close to zero. And in this case, white matter would be very dark. If we waited a little bit later after the inversion pulse, gray matter would be very dark. And we can just tune the sequence just so to null a particular, a particular tissue type. Uh, CSF, on the other hand, has a much more slow recovery curve, so it's sort of always negative, uh, if you will. But we look at magnitude images, so it always just has a positive pixel intensity. So if we uh, play an inversion pulse and we acquire images specifically at this point in time, this is the kind of contrast that I'll see. The gray matter is, in fact, going to be slightly brighter than the white matter. Uh, and so, and you can see that would be true from these, from these sort of reflected or magnitude recovery terms. So this is uh, playing an inversion pulse, uh, waiting 200 milliseconds, and then acquiring a spin echo image. I can wait for more time after my inversion pulse, and my contrast is, is quite different, right? At this point in time here, I've gotten white matter to be very, very dark. So I'm very close to the null point of white matter's recovery. It's working its way back to equilibrium, but I took my picture as it crossed the zero point, and white matter here looks quite dark. Gray matter, CSF, actually look relatively similar, uh, at least as, as it's window leveled. I can keep going, right? I can play my inversion pulse, and now I wait for things to recover. Wait, 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 wait. And if I wait, in this case, about 1,000 milliseconds, it's not quite right, or that's not quite the number that we showed in the previous slide, but at about 1,000 milliseconds, I can see that the CSF looks relatively dark, and I have some white matter, gray matter contrast. And so this image here is getting close to, to flare contrast, fluid attenuated inversion recovery uh, image contrast. Uh, this is how it sort of comes together uh, from a pulse sequence perspective. I play an inversion pulse and then a 90, 180 refocusing pulse. If my TE is short and my TI is short, I still have a pretty flat image, right? I have very little image contrast still. Uh, and you saw that actually in the previous slide. I can play my inversion pulse, wait a while before playing my 90, 180 to form my echo. And now I have some gray matter, white matter contrast uh, relative to what I had in the say previous image. And then I, similarly, I can keep moving this spin echo imaging module out. I'm extending my TE, uh, sorry, my TI, and pushing this imaging module to be later and later. And I'm capturing the state of the magnetization as, uh, you know, in this case, as white matter is crossing its null point or very close to its null point. And then I can go out even further uh, and maybe get something that's close to a, a flare or, or a fluid attenuated uh, image. So I need a really long TI uh, to null things like CSF. Uh, here's some uh, simple examples of, of uh, sort of using the short tau uh, inversion recovery sequence. Uh, remember, short tau is a, is a short uh, inversion time. So something like fat, uh, shown here in the yellow curve, I invert everything. Uh, 
And if I, if I wait just a short amount of time, then fat will have recovered the most quickly, get to the zero point the most quickly. Uh, if I form an image at this point in time, then fat will actually be quite dark. So here's a just conventional T2 weighted image on the left, and here's a T2 weighted image with an inversion pulse, in the, where the inversion pulse timing is really short, and you can see that the subcutaneous fat here in particular is quite dark. So it's a fat suppression or a fat saturation technique. Um, there's other strategies for this. Here's a STIR versus a T2 weighted image for MSK, uh, just some coronal images. And you can see that the, at least on, so this is the T2 weighted image on the right, and this is the STIR image on the left. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, obviously some uh, sort of degeneration here in the left uh, image, whereas on the right-hand side image, maybe that's a little harder to see or, or not quite as conspicuous. So by suppressing things like fat, uh, you can also exaggerate so, uh, the presence or absence of edema and maybe pick that up a little bit more clearly. Uh, one last example, and then I think we're uh, close to done. This is still using the inversion recovery spin echo sequence, but when the timing is such that it nulls CSF, we call that flare. So uh, typically flare would be a T2 weighted image. Uh, obviously the goal is to null CSF. How do we do that? Well, we play an inversion pulse. Each of the different tissue types recovers as it will, and we just wait until CSF is close to its null point, and that's when we form our image. And so there we need a long inversion time. We have to invert and wait a while before forming our image if we want CSF to be dark. Uh, and that means maybe a, an inversion time of you know uh, two, two seconds or even two and a half seconds or something like that. And so the comparison here is between an axial T2 weighted image so it's a, this is going to have an intermediate uh, TE or maybe a long TE with a long TR. And now if we acquire a very, very similar spin echo sequence but add that inversion pulse, then we get the nulling of CSF that you can see surrounding the brain and the ventricles as well. And that can give you better conspicuity for uh, a variety of different things. Here's an example of looking for a, a small stroke. Uh, and so on a T2 flare weighted image where we can null the CSF, we can see that there's some nearby uh, tissue here that's quite bright, uh, whereas you don't pick up on that nearly as easily on the fast spin echo image. So flare is going to attenuate uh, the CSF signal and, and potentially improve uh, overall lesion conspicuity. So that was a bunch of things uh, relatively quickly about spin echoes and all the different ways or many of the ways that we can manipulate uh, overall image contrast. We'll do a, a few quick true falses and then uh, turn you loose. Uh, so IR spin echo uses two inversion pulses. I'd say false. It uses two 180 pulses, but the first pulse is the inversion pulse, and the second pulse is a refocusing pulse. The spin echo uses the refocusing pulse. How about this? IR spin echo can only null a single T1 species. I think what I meant is like at a time or in an image, right? So I can only null one T1? True, right? Every tissue is recovering on its own path. At any given time, only one of those is going to be at zero. And so, I, uh, um, so in principle, you can only null one T1. So this is true. Uh, we can easily estimate the TI that will null a particular tissue. You're putting together a protocol, your flare sequence disappeared, but you have an inversion recovery spin echo sequence. Can you guess what your inversion time should be for a, for a flare sequence pretty quickly? Yes, because we saw it was log 2 or 0.69 times the T1. And of course, you have memorized a few T1s, right? CSF, fat, and something else. Uh, inversion recovery spin echo emphasizes T2 contrast. Inversion recovery is really used to manipulate T1 contrast. So these are, these are techniques that are heavily emphasizing T1 differences uh, in general. Uh, flare nulls fat. False. Flare nulls CSF. Good. Okay, so I think that wraps it up. There's, again, some learning objectives here you can work your way through just as a way to review the material. And uh, I will see you sometime next week. I think it's maybe Monday, Tuesday, but I forget.